During this episode, we're going to talk to Getty Sports photographer Cameron Spencer on how he got this famous shot of Usain Bolt. Uh, welcome to PhotographyTV.com. This site is designed to educate, entertain, and inspire you around all things photography, and today is no exception. We have a huge opportunity to interview a world-renowned sports photographer, Cameron Spencer. Uh, Cameron has a phenomenal resume. Uh, he shot five Olympic Games, uh, two FIFA World Cups, and three Rugby World Cups, and a lot of other events. And so we are thrilled to have Cameron Spencer on Photography TV. Cameron, welcome. Thanks, Paul. Good to be here. Uh, I'm so thrilled to talk with you. Uh, anything you'd add to your resume or, or tell us a little bit about yourself as a photographer? We'd love to hear your story. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I kind of got a, a camera from my granddad when I was seven years old and played around with it. I was really interested in it. And it wasn't until high school that I sort of took up photography as like an art major at school and then really got passionate about it. And from there, I went to university and got a degree called visual communication. And that was really good because it taught me a lot of the fundamentals of photography. And a lot of people know that there's no direct path to becoming a photographer. Right. You know, you can learn from from assisting. You can go study it. You can hang out with other photographers. It, it all depends. Like there's no right or wrong way. I did the university thing. Then after that, I ended up going out, assisting people and doing freelancing. And then next thing you know, a few things happen. And I landed a job at Getty back in 2002. So I've been there for a long time now. Oh, that's fantastic. And and just hearing that, obviously you went to the university, doing the assisting, starting to work for Getty. What would you say was kind of that pivotal moment where you felt, all right, I have a career as a photographer and you saw that path ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, it's competitive like anything creative. People know that it's hard to get work. And uh, out of university, I was confident I'd get something and it was really hard so that's when I started doing a lot of freelancing and it wasn't until I got offered an opportunity actually as a picture desk editor at Getty Images yeah. I applied for that role and got that and I think once I was in the door at Getty I got given a lot of opportunities and you have to create your own opportunities too so I basically said to the guys look I'd love to come out with you on the weekends and photograph sport and learn from you and then I'm based in Sydney Australia and a lot of the other photographers in Sydney from the newspapers you know they're really passionate about photography and they're really kind of open to sharing their ideas and secrets and how they do things and they sort of took me under under their wing and uh, there was like probably six guys I could name who were really influential and uh, from there I sort of went out, learned as much as I could and next thing you know a couple of people shifted overseas like to New York and places like that and an opportunity came along to become a staff photographer. So that was in 04, so yeah, 12 years Good. ago. But I, what I'm hearing there is, you know, you made, you made the opportunities yourself, going above and beyond, learning from others, putting in the time, huge. Uh, yeah. and, and clearly you, you've, you've, uh, you've been operating at the peak of your game, like you mentioned, for a long time. So phenomenal. All right, Cameron, let's now spend a little bit of time talking about probably the most famous shot that came out of the Rio Olympic Games, which was your shot of Usain Bolt in the semifinals of the 100 meter dash. So I would love to hear the story of this photograph. So here we are looking at it on screen. Uh, I could talk about this for a lot of time, but we don't want to hear my insights about this photograph. We want to hear your insight. So tell us, let's start with the story before this shot. Set it up for us. How did it get, uh, how did it come to be? And you know, tell us the, the backstory behind it. Yeah, sure. Well, I've seen him at all three Olympics for a start and it's funny how when you're younger you're a lot more stressed because it's such a huge occasion and the Olympics is bigger than anything and my first Olympics was Beijing and I remember the night the bolt ran in the 100, I had to shoot uh, action at the velodrome, so cycling, then I had to race from the velodrome to the start line of the 100 and that my role that night was to photograph the start and you get there, you're all sweaty, you're rattled and uh, I managed to get a picture of them coming off the blocks but... You know, from then on to London and then since London, I've done two world championships with him too. And so I've had the opportunity to photograph him a lot and you start learning what he does. And, you know, he does a lot of entertaining with the crowd and stuff before he races too. And you, you learn how his technique's so perfect. And from that, I kind of knew that he runs really straight with his head and that makes it good to pan him. And so 
on the night that I got the photo of Bolt, uh, I was actually in field at the track and field that night. So we had assigned positions and we had a big meeting with everyone at Getty Images before it started and we knew what our role was that night. And a lot of people don't realize we had about six editors at the track that night, 11 photographers, and between us we had about 30 cameras set up, including like a lot of remote cameras. So when the semifinals happened, I was photographing the high jump infield and it was men's qualifications but because it was qualifications they all have a few jumps so I knew I had time to run across and try and get a shot of him in the semis before I actually had to photograph him in the final my role in the final was you know like two meters past the finish line and then as soon as he crossed I had to get him crossing and then do the lap of honor with him so chase him around and luckily only four people get to photograph the run around like up close with him and so that was a bit of a privilege but uh that night at the track, there was also 600 photographers photographing Bolt. So, yeah, I decided to go in field, try a pan. So I was shooting at a slow shutter speed. I knew it around the 70 meter mark he'd be in in the lead. And usually around that time, if he's in front enough, he'll also sort of turn the gas off if he likes to slow down because he needs to save a bit of energy for the final. And uh, yeah, it was at that moment that he kind of looked in field, checking out where the other guys were in the race. And I think. He kind of smirked at them or smiled, but it was my direction and that's when it sort of became the image that it is and that element makes it special. Otherwise, it was just another pan shot of Bolt. So, you know, I made decisions that night to be in a certain place, choose a certain lens, choose a certain shutter speed and then, you know, there's an element of luck, but you create your own luck and I believe in that strongly. You know, if you are prepared and you take a chance if you like often the unexpected happens and that's what's so beautiful about sports photography you can't recreate it and that moment will never happen again and if you stuff it up you stuff it up but this time it worked out and luckily it was a big occasion and yeah next thing you know I looked at the back of my camera and saw the smile and went this is special and literally ran to my computer and you know we have fiber optic cable laid under the stadium that goes straight up to editors and plug my card in it spools up to them and they move the picture really quickly and uh yeah for the final as well you know we got a picture on news decks around the world in 59 seconds so that's the kind of speed we're talking about we but we can go into that a bit later if you like but uh yeah it's a big sort of team effort and uh yeah luckily that shot got picked up early on social media in particular twitter and instagram and then Next thing you know, you know, newspapers online and in particular online were like running stories on it and it wasn't until the end of the night because I had to concentrate on the final. You know, I couldn't sit on my phone all night looking at how many likes I was getting on Instagram. I had to <laughs> basically stay focused and, you know, get through the evening because it was the 100 metres men's final is the blue ribbon event of the Olympics, mm-hmm. if you like, and that probably along with, you know, Phelps in the pool, some of those races are, you know, big occasions too. But for me, that was the most pressure I was under and I think everyone was under. And once that race was finished that night, you know, you could relax a bit and that's when I started looking at my phone and got a lot of messages and then that's when I also got an opportunity to, you know, actually Instagram it myself and, yeah, it was a pretty cool moment. There, there's so much there I want to dig into. The speed of it. Is phenomenal, yeah. 59 seconds, that the quote you had there. Let me dig into the shot a little bit more if I could. So you mentioned the slower shutter speed, the pan. Um, take us through yeah. kind of the, the, the technical aspect of that. Mo- probably mostly what I'm curious of is just how do you make sure you get the focus? Because, you know, yeah. obviously focus is all depth driven and there's however many different lanes of people. Like how are you nailing that focus and just tracking and making sure it's, it's sharp? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, one good thing is, you know, Canon and Nikon launch new cameras every year. There's a Summer Olympics. So we just got new cameras, you know, about a month before the Olympics started. And I'm a Canon guy and I'm using the new 1DX Mark II. And it's, you know, the best camera I've ever used. It's really sharp. It's amazing at tracking and, you know, it, everything's still manual on it. And I, except focus, so I'm, I'm using autofocus, but I still choose what I want to focus on. And, You can choose, you know, a lot of focus points or, you know, really narrow in on like a single point. And for track and field, I like a single point so I can be really precise on what I'm focusing on. And I also wanted to be on his head. So I'm trying to focus his head as he's running at 30, you know, 20 miles an hour, whatever it is. And, uh, yeah, aperture is less important with a pan, but I also made a decision to have a bigger aperture because then I get more things that are – 
it's almost like more depth of field, but even though there's movement, it creates more lines, which gives you that sense of speed. Uh, you know, if it was more of a shallow depth of field like I'd shoot normally for, for right. sport, everything's sort of slightly out of focus, but it still has movement. But I think the sharper it is, the better the movement looks. Yeah. So I made that decision, but also I wanted to shoot at a 40th, which is pretty slow. Uh, any slower and you wouldn't start getting too much movement in the head. So you need to kind of make that call. And that's something that comes with experience too. You kind of know what shutter to shoot at. And, you know, with a car, you can shoot even slower or a motorbike because there, there's even less movement. But with a, with someone running, most runners, you can't shoot at a 40th. You know, if I went to the local park and tried to pan someone, it would look horrible. But Bolt has such a great technique and his head's so still, that's the shutter I went for. And, yeah, luckily it worked. <laughs> yeah, but your, and, uh, your point about experience is spot on. You knew his technique. You knew yeah. kind of the, the style. I love hearing how you used the single point, just got it right on his head and was able to track him. What yeah. aperture were you at? Well, it's a good question. I, I don't know the exact average. I'd have to look at the metadata, but I think it's around F11 okay. maybe. Uh, but, yeah, the aperture is less important than the shutter to get that of result. Course. But I was conscious of the aperture I wanted to, to give that effect. Um, but, yeah, I also chose to go on a 70 to 200 mil lens at around 135 yeah. mil because you kind of compress them a little bit. And also if you're too wide, you know, you lose the impact of the, the image. And if you're too tight, it's even harder. The longer the focal length, the harder it is to shoot slow because – you know, there's a lot more movement even in your lens when you're holding it. So it's sort of, yeah, it's all handheld. And I literally, that actual race is really funny. There was a false start in it. I remember that. So as soon as that happened, I had to bolt to the start line, change my settings, shoot, you know, in case it was bolt. Imagine bolt got disqualified. So I wasn't sure who, you know, you don't know exactly until you see the replay. And it's instant disqualification these days with the 100 meters. So, you know, the official comes out, puts the red card up, and marches someone off and luckily it wasn't bolt but then i had to run back and kind of calm down as well because wow. <laughs> i had the heart rate going. and uh yeah set set the right uh you know the right settings again and basically when they when the gun went off you know it's only nine and a half seconds so after a couple of seconds i literally held my breath and i find if you hold your breath and i've got my elbows on yep. my chest and everything's just a nice smooth fluid moment you you should pan okay and uh yeah, get it right. <laughs> That's phenomenal. So much there. Just the speed of decisions that you have to make, uh, the fact of the false start, just throwing you a little curveball in there. But now even here in the focal length at 135 and a shutter at 140th, yeah, you're bringing camera shake into the equation quite a bit. So you do have to be really calm with that. That's phenomenal. Uh, obviously, these details, the shot already was phenomenal, but just hearing the story behind it uh, is that much more impressive. So it's awesome. I think another thing to add to that is, you know, these cameras are amazing and you can shoot at 12 or 14 frames a second. You can't shoot at 14 frames a second when you're shooting at a 40th. So you only get one or two clicks at it per second, yeah. right? So literally there might be about six frames of him going past and it's literally like sharp, soft, sharp, sharp, soft, sharp, soft, soft. You know what I mean? So wow. Yeah, so you basically... Uh, you want to hope that they're all sharp, but the main picture, there's only one of him looking across out of the whole sequence, and that's the one that's pretty sharp. So That's fantastic. Yeah. Let's go back to a point you made earlier about the speed of getting it from your camera out to the world. So take us through that workflow of capturing that image, looking down, seeing that you had something, and then you know getting it out there. Yeah, I was going to talk about technology and how it's changed and... Uh, yeah, with technology now, you know, I've been working in photography ever since digital has been around, so I'm not really familiar with professionally working with film. You know, I used film all through university and school, but uh, even the technology's changed significantly in terms of digital since I started, uh, you know, professionally. And at the Olympics this year, you know, we had guys planning the Olympics six years out from Rio, which is crazy. And uh, we have a team called a major events team that are dedicated to planning everything and obviously a huge part of it is IT and, you know, we've got techs that spend a lot of time and do a lot of planning before the Olympics even comes about and they're there months ahead, you know, 
that I think our head of the major events team had been to Rio 13 times before the Olympics. Uh, and uh, yeah, they the IT guys laid a hundred kilometres of fibre optic cable throughout venues at, in Rio. So you know, sixty miles worth of cable, which is unbelievable. And yeah, the way it works is it's almost like having Ethernet in you know in your lounge room. It's basically a fibre optic cable, Ethernet cable that plugs into either your laptop or we can now plug them directly into yeah. cameras. So if I'm running around on the infield. I know where the cables are and every agency has different colored cables. So in Rio, Getty Images had black cabling and I knew if there's a black cable there, I knew where the cables were. I could run up to it, plug my camera in and literally hit a couple of buttons and it dumps the card within seconds and that's going straight to a team of editors that are moving the pictures. And, you know, with the 100 meters, we had dedicated guys handling certain photographers to get pictures out quickly. And, you know, I mentioned before, 59 seconds to hit news desks globally, you know, 30 seconds of that is probably the transmit. So the 30 seconds before that is literally getting the pictures, doing the selection. So which pictures are we going to send? Cropping them, editing them in Photoshop, doing minor adjustments and captioning the images and sending them out. So it's unbelievable how quickly it all happens. But it is a race, yeah, and it's like... The Olympics for photographers too. Right. You know, all the all the best photographers in the world are there to get the best images, and all the big agencies are competing against each other to get a the best quality pictures they can from the best guys they have, and get them out faster than the competitors so that their pictures get used That's right. Exactly right. And uh, yeah, we've got a great system in place, and everything went really smoothly in Rio. You know, there's always hiccups along the way, but. Yeah, everything was like seamless, especially, you know, the night of Bolt's 100, which was great. That's incredible. Uh, That's awesome here. I mean, yeah. just the six years of preparation, because yeah. you're right, I mean, it's yeah. the, the biggest events in the world, uh, Yeah. to then be able to just execute on it and pull it off. Yeah. Great story. Yeah. And, you know, I'm heading to Korea in November with some of the, you know, the major events team to, you know, talk about, the systems in place in Korea and make sure that we're sorted because uh, the next Winter Olympics is already 17 months away. Right. So it's coming fast. Yeah, we need to nut out a few I'm things. I'm sure even like the Winter Olympics must have totally different challenges because it's not in a confined venue, so to speak. You're on the side of a hill. In yeah, some cases. Oh, it's a mountain. It's crazy. Like in Sochi, we had guys laying cable in summer before it snowed because the cabling needs to go under the sure. snow. But then in certain places, it needs to go in pipes so it doesn't freeze. And then <coughs> stuff stuff happens where you can't get cabling to, say, halfway up the freestyle course for moguls or for the slope style. So we have these IT guys who are designing these aerials that you plug in your camera that look like those big mushrooms you see on broadcast yeah. cameras. And these, these uh, aerials are basically transmitting pictures to repeaters on top of mountains that are then sending them to like cabling that's going 35 miles to the Sochi main media center down in the city. And like the technology, don't ask me if something right. goes wrong how to fix it, but pretty amazing how, how it works. And yeah, hey, you and I are just, you know, with wife, we're just uh, thrilled to get yeah. our Skype going, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awesome. But uh, yeah, it, it's incredible. And you know, there's, robots now that we use and you know the other agencies are using where we have a robot underwater at the swimming or we have a robot in the roof over the 100 meters finish line and you know these things are controlled by photographers sitting somewhere else they could be in the main press center operating the cameras and not only can you now change the camera settings you can actually track the camera too so you know one of our guys Richard Heathcote he was panning a roof camera at the swimming pool as swimmers went underneath him, shooting slow and getting like artistic pictures that's never been done before from from a robot, anyway. And uh, yeah, it's amazing stuff. Oh, that's awesome. While we're on the topic of just the Olympics in in total, take, like, what is the experience like? Go back to Brazil, maybe as an example. Like, what does your day look like? How many events are you shooting? Take us through the experience of being an Olympic photographer. Yeah. Well. Uh, you know, a few of us had, had done like the last two world championships, track and field, for example. So I kind of knew that I was going to be doing track and field for, you know, half the Olympics. It goes to, I think it's an eight or nine day okay. meet. 
but I still had other events to do before that. So, you know, the whole team rolled into Rio about a week before day one and it's a good opportunity to go to different venues, have a look at, you know, the courses or the courts or whatever, you know, you're looking at and then work out what lenses you think will be good for those events and then you start testing the technology so it's good to plug cameras in, send tests, check with the guys in the main press center who are editing everything, hey, are you seeing this stuff? And then, you know, we start planning who's doing what sports and, you know, there's a group of, of uh, assignment editors that are in charge of that and they make sure that, you know, get images. We cover every gold medal event, for example. So every medal event we were at and, you know, we do all the heats for relevant sports where we have clients that are interested in, you know, that coverage and, uh, you know, the main, you know, pretty much everything in the pool, we cover everything. We cover everything in the track and field, everything, you know, to do with cycling, you know, the majority of the rowing, you know, all the big events we're at and uh, we do, you know, a lot of a lot of coverage and I kind of knew my schedule for sort of the first three or four days, you know, three or four days before that and then, you know, they brought out another sort of three or four days worth of coverage and then you know who you're working with too, so you can speak about how you're going to get to the venues, uh, who's going to do what. You know, even though you know photography can be quite a personal thing, you still are working in a team environment where you need to work out who's going to do what end of the court, who's going to do what end of the field, who's going to do the finish line, who's going to do the medal ceremonies. You know, there's a lot that you need to discuss before it starts. And you know, are we both on Canon? If so, can one of us bring a 600mm lens for the rowing and we'll share it? Or do we, you or Nikon, do we both have to bring long lenses? You know, there's a lot of that chat that goes on. And uh, then you sort of work out, you know, where's the best angles for these sports? A lot of sports at the Olympics, you know, you never cover besides at an Olympics. And so, you know, yeah, I did indoor volleyball. I never shoot indoor volleyball. And I've done it before back in Beijing. But, you know, you need to get up to speed with, the rules, you know, when is it match point? Yeah. You know, if you don't know, you've got to be ready for like jubilation or dejection or ready for that emotional picture. And if you're like trying to do some creative <laughs> shot and the team's going celebrating, you know, they're going to go, where are the pictures? Right. Wow. So you do need to get up to speed with certain sports, you know, things like archery or taekwondo. You know, I, I'm not familiar with all the in, intricates of the sports. And That's so, right. you know, you need to. Yeah, get across it. And like even things like rowing, people don't really think about rowing, but from a photographic point of view, if you're at the finish line or you're at the end of the course, everyone's facing backwards because they're facing towards the start line. So you're not going to get shots of anyone if you're near the finish. You need to be down the course and looking back down the course towards the finish line in order to get the faces of the athletes competing because whilst you might get a nice artistic shot or a silhouette from back on, you know, there's newspapers in New Zealand going, hey, where's the pictures of our New Zealand rowers? Or, exactly, you know right. I mean? It's important to not only get the pictures that are required, but if you can be creative as well, that's even better. But we do have a shot list every day that we have to capture too. So we'll get an email every night prior to the next day going, hey, here's the athletes from each country that we need. Uh, don't miss them basically. Yeah. And there might be a race where there's nobody – you know, that we really need in that race. So that might be an opportunity to do something creative or, you know, try an unusual angle. And I think if you go back to the bolt picture too, you know, I could have blown that picture, but I knew there was 11 of us at the track that night and I wasn't going to pan him crossing the finish line in the final because I had a role to play getting that angle from the inside of the track. But for the semi, if I didn't get the picture, it wasn't the end of the world because we had a lot of versions of it from different angles. But... That's why I decided to take a risk and, you know, shoot the slow shutter and try and get something different that is harder to capture, if you like. That's what's cool about that is, yeah, you you know what you have to get and either you've already got it or perhaps there's a, a race or something where you're not required to get something. That's when you can take the risk that obviously can pay off, as we saw, or it's not a big deal if, if something doesn't work out. That's good, good insight. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, certain sports – some of the best pictures are often from warm up or training because say back in Sochi at the you know the aerial skiing in warm up I'm allowed to stand under the jump looking straight up at the skiers spinning in the air but during competition as if you'd be allowed to stand under the jump like it's 
off-putting and it's dangerous. And so, you know, you need clearance from the, the officials. Hey, can I stand here during warm-up? And they'll give you a yes or no answer. But it's thinking about, hey, what can I get here that's different that I might not be able to get during competition? Yeah. And, yeah, it, often those shots, you know, uh brilliant because they're different and unique and you know you don't get the opportunity to do it during the actual event but then 100 meters for example you know a shot of them warming up is not going to make a picture right so you know you got to think about the sport and go hey where can i go that i might be able to get something that you know might not happen again or might not happen during competition so it's important like you know with the rowing too you know competition might not start till 9 a.m but if you turn up at 6 a.m you're going to get beautiful yellow skies and sunrise pictures that, you know, are, are different. And even though it's teams training and warming up, you know, we're all obsessed with getting great pictures and you put in that extra time and, you know, get get to the rowing three or four hours early in order to chance a sunrise picture that'll look really nice. Um, but, yeah, back to track and field too. For that, it pretty much was a day session and a night session every day and every night. And we'd leave every morning at like 6.37 a.m., get to the track shortly after, maybe, you know, 7.38 and we'd be setting up all the remotes, making sure everything was working, uh, plan out who's covering what for the session and then after that we'd usually grab some lunch somewhere and chill out for a bit and then for the night session that might start at 8 o'clock at night, you know, you need to be back there at 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock to do it all again and, uh, you know, you can't leave cameras lying around either like you can at certain events because, Unfortunately, in Rio, you know, gear was getting pinched, so you had to be careful. You couldn't leave remote cameras lying on the finish line, for example, so we had to pack them up and roll them back out before each session. And then, uh, yeah, often the night sessions might not finish till midnight, 1 a.m., and then you're so wired because you're so Absolutely. pumped. You know, the adrenaline shooting, you know, people achieving their lifelong dreams, you can't just go, all right, right. I'm off to bed, you know what I mean? So then you'd go and have something to eat, maybe have a couple of beers and next thing you know it's 3 a.m. and you go to bed and you're back up at 6, 6.30. So it's weird this kind of cycle of living off three hours sleep every night and you get through it somehow, you know. Even if you're sick, you manage to just plow through it and you know that you've got four years to recover. That's what I always say, you know, go hard and, you know, you can catch up on sleep later and, yeah, you don't want to regret you know, not giving it your all, just like an athlete would, you know, not give it their all at the Olympics. So I think everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's, you know, missing their partners or their families. You know, everyone's in the same boat. And I think being in a team where everyone looks out for each other is really important and it helps you get through some days that are pretty hard. Oh, like no. mid-Olympics, you hit a wall and you're like, it's day seven. We've got nine more days of this and, you know, a bit of humour helps, you know. And, uh, you know, once you get a few pictures under your belt too that you like, you, you kind of get a bit of a morale boost and I think that's really important. And also just looking out for your colleagues, making sure everyone's okay. And uh, it is like a team. It's almost like, you know, you're in a war zone and you're, you're checking on your brothers and making sure that everyone's okay. But uh, at the end, it's such a rewarding feeling where you look at the set of pictures that, you know, you get personally, but also the whole team gets, and you go, "Wow, this is you know probably the best Olympics we've we've ever done." And you know, Rio was a perfect example of that, where there was so much great stuff, and a lot of venues were pretty pretty hard to get good pictures. It was hard because of messy backgrounds, or maybe there was not a big crowd at a morning session at the track and field, or you know, maybe it was a grey morning or it was raining. You know, sometimes you really have to work hard to get a sure. picture, and yeah, it's it's good when you know, you managed to get a couple of picks out of the whole event. So Phenomenal backstory. What I see on TV, I can see the photographers. I always aspire like, wow, I wonder what goes into that, how, how, to, how to get there. And you're, you're showing just the, the experience that's needed, the, the effort that goes into it. There's so much work that you're putting into it and, and the results are, are phenomenal. So if you were talking to someone that was aspiring to reach the levels of photography that you've reached, you know, what would you tell someone would be the path that they could go on to, to try to shoot for Getty, to try to be a photographer at the Olympics? What would be some advice you'd yeah. give them? I think, firstly, you have to have the passion. If, if you're doing it because it's just a job, then you're going to lose interest and you, you'll lose your way as well. But if you know, you're passionate about photography and you, know, you love going to work every day, then 
you know, it's never even really a job. It's like, you know, something I love doing. And I think for young people, it's important to just keep shooting and get a lot of experience. And, you know, the way I learned so fast with shooting sport was just asking a lot of questions and finding guys who are the best at what they do. And if they're good, they're going to be confident and they're going to share their knowledge with you. If they're not confident or they're not, you know, who they think they are, they're not going to offer you advice and then they're the people you go, all right, cool, I'll find someone else to to learn from. And, you know, I feel like I want to give back to young photographers because, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of great guys give me advice when I was, you know, younger. And I think it's great to see new talent coming through because, you know, suddenly, you know, all the guys that I remember starting out with, you know, we were all in our 20s and now, you know, we're in our 30s and next thing you know, we're going to be in our 40s and it's like, Where's the next breed of photographers? And, you know, you look at the Olympics, there's a lot of photographers, you know, I'd say the average age is, you know, late 30s, mid 40s, you know, but there's guys there in their 50s and 60s. You know, it's also awesome seeing, you know, girls get into sports photography. You know, we've got some some of our best photographers are female at Getty and, you know, sure there's a lot of men that photograph sport but there's also you know some some women out there that are amazing photographers and i'd love to see you know more women take on the you know take on sports photography as a career and you know we got some some young you know young women in in the states that are sort of showing up everyone you know they're like the rising stars of photography over there and it's great to see and you know it's just uh helping each other out and you know giving feedback to the young people and, you know, one day they'll probably be thanking you for it or, you know, you'll see them win an award and it'll be a good feeling because, you know, the guys that, you know, helped me along the way are now like consider them friends as well and, you know, it's cool to see the sort of people you admired growing up still at the Olympics, you know, and you see them all these years later and, uh, yeah, they're still doing their thing and it, the reason is that, you know, they love their craft, they're passionate about photography and, yeah, they they wouldn't miss, you know, miss the opportunity for, for anything. And I think the day I lose interest in in sport or lose interest in photography, I'll probably find something else to do. But right now I'm obsessed with it. And when I'm not at work or not doing a job assigned by Getty, you know, I'm wandering around with a camera on my phone Instagramming, you know. So it's like it's one of those things where, uh, you know, a new drone got launched this morning. I'm on there yeah. checking it out, you know. There's like constantly something happening and, you know, I'm not a gadget freak or anything like that but you know i'm consumed by it and i think uh you know having a little baby girl now too you know i love documenting her life you know and seeing her change so much and you know photographing her is awesome fun too and yeah i mean my other piece of advice is just always have a camera with you because you know one day you'll see something incredible and you'll miss that opportunity and you'll never okay. forget the day that that happened and you didn't have a camera on you and you know i've missed you know beautiful double rainbows or sunrises or things like that along the way when I've been on walks and you go, oh, if only I had a camera. And I, you know, the iPhone is a good little camera to have on you at all times now. And, you know, I'd, I'd rather have a, you know, a small a small little mirrorless camera or something with me, but, you know, you got to have something on you. You don't, you don't carry the uh, Canon everywhere you go? Uh, I've got, I've, I've actually got this little piece with me now. Oh, yeah, very nice. This, this, this isn't a... Uh, a product plug, but it's a, a little power shot cannon. It, it's a great little camera. And I think the awesome thing now, you know, is these little cameras can, uh, you know, you can Wi-Fi to your phone. And if you want to get that picture out on social media, you can do it pretty quickly directly from these little cameras. And, yeah, the quality of compact cameras has come a long way. Sure, you can't shoot high-end sport on them, but you can take a nice portrait or a nice landscape shot wandering Absolutely. around. Absolutely. So, Incredible yeah. insight from an incredible photographer. Cameron, thank you so much for sharing your story with us here at photographytv.com. I you know I'm just getting started in building this website and YouTube channel. So the fact that you would take so much time out of your day to spend with us is a testament to the type of person that you are and how dedicated you are to helping other photographers along their journey. I am so thankful to you. Thank you, Cameron. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, good luck to all the budding photographers out there. I'll be looking out for you on Instagram. <laughs> you know, I'm so thrilled to have spent this time with Cameron. Here at Photography TV, we want to do more of these types of interviews. So please subscribe to us on YouTube. And if you want to hear from other photographers, leave a comment in the comments section as to 
what photographers or what type of photographers you want to hear from next on future interviews on photographytv.com.